I'm Jim Hunsinger of Lean Frontiers, and I will be your host of today's webinar. Before we begin, there's a few logistical points I'd like to go over briefly. Um, today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email shortly after the recording to link to be able to view this on demand. And please share it with others in your organization and even consider using it for a lunch and learn or something like that. Also, due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions, but if you have questions, our presenter will share his email with you and uh, you can email him directly with your questions. Also, today's webinar is lead up to Leadership Week, which takes place September 12th and 13th in Austin, Texas. Uh, please consider joining us for this event and you can learn more about the summit by visiting leanfrontiers.com backslash L-A-M-S. So with that said, let me welcome and introduce our presenter today. Sam Yankovich um, focuses his work on lean concepts to re reduce waste caused by miscommunication and cultural issues. He is also the author of a number of books, including Walking the Invisible Gimba. So let's get started, Sam. Uh, let me kick this off by asking you, um, gathering from the title, we have of your webinar, you're not quite in agreement with tearing down silos. Yet most people we, that uh, talk about this issue say silos are a huge obstacle. Um, what's your thinking about this? Yeah, right, thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thanks, uh, by the way, for uh, this opportunity. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to uh, meeting again uh, in September at the summit in Likewise. Austin. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I, my work, has been related to lean communication, and I, I go out there and I look a lot of I look at a lot of global uh, companies and how they work. So uh, I get to see a lot of extremes, uh, and by looking at extremes, sometimes it's great because you are able to pick out things that you wouldn't see otherwise when things are kind of subtle. And so global teams and teams that are impacted through um, mergers and acquisitions, uh, for example are great opportunities that I've, that I've had to see what's really going on. And uh, in any of these cases, in any of the extreme cases, uh, I have to acknowledge that every department, every resource uh, is value, either through their knowledge, you know, their brilliance, but every resource is essential and, uh, and, and very specialized. Uh, so, you know, so to talk about tearing down is kind of a little bit of a bot uh, bothersome, but I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, a little bit more. Sure. Um, if each of these uh, resources is essential and specialized, then I think it's it's better to look at it in a different way. Look, uh, you know, in, in our uh, when we work with cultural, uh, you know, with multicultural teams, you know, we always bring up this uh, saying that you can take the Chinese person out of China, but you can't take the Chinese out of the Chinese person. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing about you know not being able to remove somebody from R and D finance, engineering, human resources, they're all essential functions. And, you know, so the, so the problem is not, uh, is not about tearing down. Um, I'm, I'm more of, you know, when I hear tearing down, it sounds like a destructive force that we have to apply. Uh, in my, you know, in, in my workshops, I try to look for something more harmonizing, uh, integrating, uh, aligning. And so I'd like to use more of a positive connotation to what the work that needs to be done. Also because, you know, if you remember uh, Newton's, one of Newton's laws is, you know, if you apply force in one direction, you're going to get equal force back. Yeah, we talk about respect that happens. You disrespect somebody, you're going to get disrespect back. Um, also, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the uh, presentations and work I do, I bring up a story that really talks about um, you know, this, this thing about silos, which is the story of the Airbus um, 380, when they tried to uh, launch that first uh, aircraft, uh, they suffered a delay of about 20 months. And the reason was because of the silo mentality and the thinking that existed there. And what it created was when they started to assemble the, the airplane from back to front, they couldn't connect the wires. Some of the wires were too short. I use that as a metaphor because it's the connections that we need so that an airplane can fly, so their organization can actually uh, survive. So, uh, so it's you know it's more about uh, using the 
alignment function. By the way, when we talk about uh, silos, I, you know, most everybody's talking about the horizontal silos. I want to make sure also that I bring forth the fact that we have vertical silos that disconnect yeah. between top management and the front lines. Those are silos as well. And, you know, and to think that we're going to go in there and say, oh, you must, you know, you have to break it down. You have to work together. It reminds me when I was a kid, you know, my parents, you know, telling, telling me and my, and my brother and sister and say, yeah, you got to be friends, your brothers. It, it doesn't work like, like that. There's other ways. And I think it's really about um, reconnecting. Just on, a, on a, you know, on a, just the last point to that, that I think was your question, Jim. Uh, the disconnect is also with the customer. And I think what happens is that once you're disconnected from the customer, then that snowballs and, you know, that disconnection happens as well. So I'd like to look at it and say, you know, once upon a time, the teams were connected, management was connected to the front lines, and for whatever the reasons are, that disconnection happens. So it's more about reapproaching the, you know, that, that state. Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's almost like, yeah, if you don't have a connection with your customers, it's almost becomes like a virus that can enter the organization. And you're right, with with those flows that go horizontally and vertically, and it's kind of like, like a matrix of flows. So, you know, what I guess so instead you're really saying it's certainly about the con reconnecting of the silos so people can yeah. coordinate and collaborate with each other, right? I think so. I think I think that's it's it's about the reconnection. Yeah. So, you know. The, the, you know, the way I've seen it, uh, you know, I go out, see, I talk about the invisible Gemba. Um, you know, most, most of us are trained and I, I grew up on the Gemba. I didn't have senseis, you know, when I was growing up and I, you know, I, I'm not a Toyota guy, so I had to learn on my own. I was going out to the Gemba, but I started seeing that there's that, uh, you know, that Gemba where people are interacting. I go out to the Gemba and see how people interact. interact. And what I've seen is that the connections do exist. Unfortunately, uh, you know, they are not in flow. In other words, there's a lot of connections that are happening with resistance, you know, going back to the wire. You have resistance, so you have the resistance, and when you have the interactions, you're gonna be creating waste. In the case of the wire, there's gonna be in the form of heat. But in the case of, um, of you know, walking the invisible Gemba, when I go out there and see the, the behaviors, because you have to observe the behaviors of people, I see people pointing fingers at each other or at the different departments. You see poor collaboration, uh, unproductive meetings. And the worst thing I see uh, is escalations. You know, escalations becomes the norm. It's like, okay, well, we can't get along. So we can't reach an agreement between the departments or, you know, top and bottom. And so you escalate and escalation became the standard. And that's a pretty bad standard to, you know, to, uh, to work with. So, uh, so it, and, and so it's about establishing the relationships first to be able to get those connections going. I like the, you know, there's a, there's a metaphor uh, also that I like is the chamber ensemble versus the philharmonic orchestra. The chamber ensemble, you know, some of them are even just one, one instrument. And somehow, and they're small, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 um, people playing together. And somehow, it works out. They have the relationship. It's small enough to, to, you know, to have that relationship. When these things grow up into philharmonic orchestras, where you have all of the instruments uh, playing, you, you know, you start seeing that there's, you know, that there could be a disconnect, um, unless you have a strong leader, which is, you know, in that case, the, the, you know, the, the director. Uh, but, you know, what happens with with these companies is, you know, you have the foundation situation, and then you start seeing that with growth. You know, problems happen. Um, I, uh, you know, there's the, the other thing that I observed aside from the relationships is the language. You know, talking about communication, each uh, different department or silo, if you may, is going to adopt their own language. Yeah. Without having a common language, how in the world are we going to create a community that is, you know, tightly knit within the organization? So, because communication and community comes from the same. From the same uh, root source, so so you hear you know you hear the different languages and um, and that you know that snowballs into when people come together to you know to solve problems you know when the work practices the daily work practices um, you you know you start seeing band aid solutions unstructured meetings and all of the waste that um, that uh, that happens with that 
so the focus becomes very internalized. And you know that's that that's a that's an, an obstacle in itself because then the focus is not where it should be, which is with the customer. That disconnect happens with the customer, and what I said before, then the disconnect will happen often with uh, you know with the different teams that have to uh, that have to work. So again, I think reconnecting is 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 really what the work is at. Yeah, so what is interesting? You talk about the the importance to be able to reconnect or the relationships. It sounds like one of the key obstacles is language that people need to have a shared language are there any other key obstacles that you you've observed or deeper deeper sources sometimes of um, uh, maybe what are obstacles to achieving that relationship that reconnection uh, yeah yeah well um you know what one of the things i notice is when i go out and and see how people interact um and when we talk about silos you know, go and find the go and find the lines of demarcation. They don't exist. They're imaginary. They're you know the, the these are you know lines made up of our own illusions. The problem is in our thinking. You know, it's really in our thinking, and um, and so so the you know the, the the key obstacle is you know how do you move away from that? And we have to understand where that thinking comes from. Coming back to the you know to the language and to what you what we observe, you know. When you walk into a place that has this silo problem really you know big like i mentioned with global teams or or situations where it's uh, mergers and acquisitions the things that i hear always is those words which is those guys and yeah. you talk to one group and they talk about those guys so that's part of the language that i was saying you know it's not only the acronyms and the terms that people use but it's that language that we use those guys uh, we tell ourselves stories and we feed ourselves those stories and then we think that those stories are are right and that they are the only story. But there's multiple stories, obviously, because every every department, every team has their own story to tell. Um, but, you know, the, the language thing, acronyms that we use. Uh, I love it when you have a financial guy talking to an engineer and they start talking about EBITDA. And the engineer is saying, what in the world is EBITDA? And then the engineer is talking about, you know, some project they're working on, let's call it the TRX 3D LIDAR system. And the accountant to the finance guy is like, what, what in the world is that? So that also, that using that language, uncommon language, uh, seems to be an obstacle that, that, that you know, that, that, you know, exacerbates uh, the situation. Um, and, and a couple of other things that I, that I know are, very uh, impactful. Uh, from the fifth discipline, where you know where Peter Senge talks about uh, structures and mental models. Yeah. You know, we draw our organizational charts in a way that helps create silos. Because yeah. when we look at the org chart, most of the org charts are drawn in a way, you know, that are formed in silos. And so we start, you know, adopting those mental models. Same thing with matrix organizations. You know, you start thinking perpendicular and and horizontal and I report to you and he's over me and it's you know all of that feeds feeds on itself so you know so that that's something but in general for people to be able to get to this this is something this is a model that I've used for global teams and it's as just as applicable uh, for local silos and I call it the Dicula triangle it's D-I-C-U-L-A I mentioned that in my uh, Walking the Invisible Gemba book and it's, it stands for distance, culture, and language. And it's that triangle that I call, those are the obstacles to excellent communication uh, between people that are distanced, either separated because of time zones or miles or whatever, um, or the people that are distanced because of the mindset, because of those mental models. You know, They could be working in the same facility, maybe even across each other, but they are worlds apart. So you have the distance factor, culture factor and the language factor that are those obstacles that then build those imaginary uh, boundaries that, that I mentioned. And so, so it's really, it's in our thinking that, that we need to get through. And we can use those three, the, the distance, culture, and language to maybe help get, uh, get past it. That's good. Yeah, I don't know. I don't mean how, how many times I've heard over the years, you said the language, those guys in accounting or those guys in manufacturing or those guys in corporate so yeah. you know i've yeah. heard that yeah you know, many yeah. many times those so, are, those are ter terrible words yeah yeah um so so with that so um 
how can people approach these situations and what are some of the steps that, that you would recommend in order for them to get through these obstacles and eventually to reconnect? Right. So, well, to begin with, uh, you can't solve a problem that you can't see. And uh, you can see the behaviors, you can see the results, but you can't see the interactions happening. And you can't see the lines because they're imaginary. You know, uh, they, they really don't, don't exist. Uh, in, in, in my view. So you want to, you have to bring them to the surface. And, you know, you do that in, in, in many ways, really bringing it up when you're doing your systemic root cause analysis or solving problems, you want to go into, I actually bring those subjects up to the, into the surface by using distance language and culture to put those on the analysis, um, you know, whether it's a fishbone diagram or wherever, because then you get to talk about it and bring it you know, bring it to the surface and, and have a conversation about what the, uh, what the issues are. But look, every organization is unique. Uh, there is no way of saying plug and play, this is what you need to do. But from the lean perspective, I don't see why we can't include, uh, you know, getting past these obstacles by putting, by tying this to our true north, you know, using this challenge that we always have you know, typically we put the challenge and we're talking about the challenge about being more competitive or, you know, reducing costs or, you know, whatever, whatever the challenge might be. But why are we only, you know, why limit only the challenge to the things that we can see and that are tangible? Why not look for challenging our organizations to deal with things such as, you know, uh, reconnecting? Uh, because to me, continuous improvement is not only about the physical processes. It's about every process. Otherwise, you know, and I mentioned that in my book, it says, otherwise we're practicing limited continuous improvement. And I think that that's not, you know, that's not a, a good way to approach. And then the structure, I mean, it's up to us to design the structure. So why does the organizational chart have to be, you know, the way that we, we draw it? I've seen some pretty interesting organizational charts that are more circular where, and, and then you have the networked organizations where you see the networks, who has to communicate with whom, and, uh, and that. Uh, from the HR perspective, um, I've seen people, I've seen companies that add in their job descriptions. You know, you have your job description, and by itself, it's kind of a silo because says, this is what your roles and responsibilities are. Why not include my role and responsibilities also to communicate with, you know, these areas specifically to be able to do my job? And they have to communicate with me. So put that explicitly in, uh, in, in job descriptions. That's kind of an HR type of thing that might, uh, that, that might be worthwhile doing. And then also rewards. You know, what are we rewarding? Are we rewarding the individual performance of finance, engineering, um, operations? Or are we rewarding based on customer benefit? And in order to do that, you have to redesign your KPIs. And I'm still yet to see a company that does, you know, pretty well with a KPI that um, promotes collaboration. And that, you know, because you promote collaboration, you're going to reduce and you're going to reconnect your your team. So it's the it's the KPIs, it's the um, you know the reward system, the structure, and tying that to your uh, true north and the challenge that's going to get you there. And one last thing that that I've practiced and that I you know trained companies to do is to have uh, ambassadors from each different department, ambassadors that can actually lead a conversation, establish the relationships uh, with people from the, other, from the other areas so that the conversation begins, so that the, the, the relationships uh, begin. So those are, you know, those are kind of the, some of the practices and things that, uh, that I've, I've used when I, when I do this work for, uh, for some of the companies. Okay. Well, good. That's good. That's good to know. So one thing I know, because this is this question always comes up whenever we're talking things about around this, are what's what's leadership's role in this? Um, I'm assuming they'd have some level of responsibility in this regard. And um, you know, the things that can help. I'm assuming to reconnect them with on the front lines, uh, department level, um, right. even functional levels. Right. Well, I think I think what. You know, from my from what I was uh, talking about uh, just just now, I think a lot of those things are actually things that are uh, related more to the leadership. Also, because you know, when you talk about cultural change, yeah. a lot of 
things were about cultural change and people follow the leader. And you know, we listen to the leader, we follow the leader, and it's not only what they say, but what they do and their behaviors, and we follow that and we take those as messages and then we behave accordingly. So those, you know, the structural stuff and uh, you know, the true north and all that, I think those are leadership things. I think at another level, at the operational level, um, I think there's a you know there's there's a couple of things that we can you know that we can uh, do which is ends up in our work practices. But but uh, but before that, you know, Deming, for example, um, has this phrase that says um, quality, or it's attributed to Deming. I'm still to see, yet I haven't found it in his work, but I know that it's attributed to him. Where it says quality is everyone's responsibility, and I think that that's not clear about communication. I think communication is always, oh, you have to, you know, it's your, it's your, your job. Communication is everyone's responsibility at every level, and then also vertically and horizontally. So at yeah. the at the individual personal level, what can we do is take communication as our as part of our jobs. You know, it's not somebody else. It takes two to tango, as they say, and you know, both the uh, the listener and the um, and the person that is that is. Uh, Sending the message. Uh, the other thing is is this you know this our, our thinking that I you know because I, I said everything is in our thinking. This thinking is me 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 me. We forget about the customer. So you want at every level you want to make sure that everybody's thinking is I'm here because of the customer. I'm not here because of you know because of me or what I do. I'm here because of the customer. Because once you start that connection, then start it, it actually creates what I call a chain reaction where you form these supplier customer relationships internally until all of the values added to to provide the end customer uh, one of the things I I, uh, I you know I change subtly in the in the in the communication in the way that we communicate because communication people say oh it's a transmitter and a receiver yeah. you know, when you do that it's like robots but Companies and organizations, until we're all replaced by by robots one day, uh, Jim. But until that happens, if it's our responsibility, then why don't we treat our, you know, uh, the people we work with, our colleagues, as in a customer supplier relationship? Because we really want to satisfy the customer all the time, and when we do that, you'll want to have that communication in a way that yeah. fits uh, everybody. Uh, the and the other two things is teamwork, which is a big word. Because there's a lot of fake teamwork, you know, my yeah. team versus your team, which is what we're actually talking about. So in order to get that going, sometimes you need facilitation. And you know, I've I've used the people that are trained in quality systems and, and and quality to lead and to facilitate because they talk about facts. They know how to ask questions so that the teams can start uh, coming together. And finally, work practices because culture forms through work practices our daily behavior. So, you know, we have a wonderful, wonderful methodology called the A3 systemic problem solving or, or A3, you know, goal setting or, or, or strategic, you know, strategic planning. Uh, and to me, that's, that's a fantastic device to bring people together because you have to have cross-functionality uh, to solve these complex problems. And so it's an excellent way to, you know, to create that is to standardize the use of A3 across the board because when you have these meetings where people can't talk to each other, bring the A3 or some you know a process like that. Uh, the other thing is using lessons learned uh, and establishing lessons learned because that's also something that helps you know make the teams very cohesive. Uh, use consensus uh, activities. Nemawashi is a fantastic way of, of doing it, you know, and uh, it's not done enough because Nemawashi really is something that will bring all of the, you know, both vertically and horizontally, it helps uh, bring bring the teams together. And um, and by the way, Deming's operational definitions are structured in such a way to help break down the language barrier. The, you know, you start having these common, you know, with with common operational definitions, you get over this language stuff that happens that every uh, every team's gonna, um, you know, is is talking a different language. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're humans working together. Collaboration is volitional. It's by choice. And until, like I said, until we're replaced by robots, 
um, you know, we better take it seriously because we might be exacerbating and accelerating uh, the fact that we're going to be taken over by robots if we can't communicate yeah. and the results uh, from lack of communication and, and uh, being in silos uh, are, you know, are, are, are killing our, our company. So those, you know, those are kind of the points. And then there's a lot of software out there that I think is, is good to help people collaborate and, 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 and connect. So some of these teams are virtual, but uh, I think the software should be should make it easier uh, for people to be uh, communicating and hopefully uh, being face to face. And if they can't be face to face, you know, do it through video like we're like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So certainly, yeah. Just I guess you can't emphasize enough just how important communication is in order to um, um, re reconnect. I mean, that's in a way that's probably the essence of the reconnection is that communication, constant communication, flowing, uh, not in just one direction, but in a loop back right. and forth and in all directions, horizontal and vertical. Right. Um, so with that, did you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the attendees? And also to certainly let people know um, how to connect with you. If they have questions, how they can get a hold of you to, to ask you. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Jim. Yeah, the final thoughts. So yeah, to what you were saying about uh, communication. So. I think uh, I think maybe I didn't mention this enough, but forming the relationship is extremely important. And uh, time is money. And I always say, you know, invest time in building relationships. The money will come. Uh, yeah, as a last word, I just wanted to share some resources, if I could. Um, sure. Absolutely. Any Deming's, you know, Deming's books, for example, or books about Deming. He explains this, the, the, you know, the organizational system as a system really well, and uh, talks about the silos uh, in a very, in a very interesting way. And so, since you know, since he is one of the persons that we discuss a lot in our lean circles, I think we should take advantage of using Deming's work for that. Um, Joseph Paris wrote a book about the state. It's called State of Readiness, and he, um, you know, it's about operational excellence. And he also talks about silos. It's a very interesting uh, work. It's, it's, it's deep. Uh, John Knotts, uh, who I met recently, uh, is a fellow out of uh, San Antonio. He is uh, just getting ready to publish a book called Overcoming Organizational Myopia. Hmm. Uh, it's all about uh, silos. It's, uh, you know, I haven't read it yet, but uh, I've spoken with him about the, the topic. And uh, I think he's spot on, so I recommend that. When that book comes out, uh, overcoming organizational myopia, uh, I think that's a that's a good thing. And my own book, Walking the Invisible, yeah. uh, which is my fourth book, um, and it's really about it, it shows a way to see the process of communication because communication is invisible. You see the results, yeah. You can't see it happening. That interaction, that that moment where the communication is 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 actually not happening. You want to be able to capture that. So walking the invisible Gemba is that. It's a good guideline on, on kind of the macro and the micro way of, uh, of using lean to improve your uh, communication processes in, the, in your organization. Uh, join me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if you look yeah. for Sam Yankelevich, it's the only Sam Yankelevich that I know on there uh, currently. And uh, or my website is samyankelevich.com and my email is sam at samyankelevich.com. You'll just have to learn how to spell the Yankelevich. Yeah. Uh, Lean Frontiers will put, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be out there on. Your name on, will be on, on this. On, on the title um, and um, and we can connect that way. And I look forward to doing that and having a, a further conversation about this topic with you. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Sam. We certainly appreciate your thought leadership and for you sharing your insights with us today. And like I said uh, at the beginning, you will receive an email shortly um, with a link to the recording. So you'll be able to, like I said, listen to this, share it with others, your colleagues in your organization uh, to get this information out as well. And also just again, another final reminder for information on Leadership Week, which again takes place September 12th and 13th in Austin, Texas, where Sam will be sharing with us there as well. So you get to see him, hear him and talk with him there also. You can get that at um, leanfrontiers.com uh, backslash L-A-M-S or just even visiting us at our website, leanfrontiers.com. So again, Sam, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who participated today 
and uh, have a great day.